Hello everyone and welcome to PyCon APAC 2022. My name is Shreya and today I'm going to be talking about my random walk towards building sequence to sequence models. So this talk is about what I've learned in my journey at Godaddy. I've been there working in data science, NLP and machine learning since the last 3 years. And while I've been reading a lot of papers, researching, building models, I've learned a few things and tricks of the business. While building sequence to sequence models have come across a lot of errors, a lot of hours have been gone in debugging and there has been constant learning in the background. And there are things that I've regretted not doing. So hopefully this talk is about to help you in knowing what things to do and what things to avoid in your journey towards building sequence to sequence models. So first let's talk about a few applications to ensure um how you can apply this to your own data case. So sequence to sequence is also the name of a particular kind of model of a recurrent neural network. However, in this talk I'm going to be referring to them as the general class of problems which cater to sequence inputs and sequence outputs kind of data problems. So a few of the applications in the research and in the industry have been something like chatbots so building dialogue systems question answering in which you're given a piece of text and a question is asked from that piece of text machine translation in fact this is one of the largest kind of problems that deal with sequence to sequence modeling and now they've become some sort of a template in which we can learn and uh, research and iterate from what we know from a lot of papers that have been published here and now there are a few applications as well in video captioning so in videos we usually have a sequence of speech that goes on and we need to convert it to a sequence of text um one kind of another interesting application is conversion of sign language to text and this is usually helpful when we are trying to cater to more segments of our population um text summarization so text summarization is about when we have book reviews or movie reviews or any kind of a problem where we're trying to build a very small summary of a very huge piece of text and it's also can be seen um in the way we google search So Google has these entire indexes of pages on the web and when you're searching for something you look at um the query that is being searched and the page which is uh, available on the internet and you try to see whether the highlights of the page match um the query that is being searched for and especially also these kind of problems are popular in speech to text um often when we look at that um the major applications are in voice technologies for example alexa siri or google assistant so as can be seen the a variety of problems here is immense and it doesn't really have to be related to text it's basically data that can be converted to a sequential form all right so let's now talk about how these kind of problems have evolved from the past now LSTMs were a special kind of recurrent neural networks and recurrent neural networks were used to model sequential data so that we know that if there are long term dependencies or short term dependencies within the data um recurrent neural networks could model them pretty well and LSTMs were a very special kind of um RNNs in which they model long term dependencies really well now in 2014 um one of the papers introduced neural networks and in the form of encoder and decoder for solving sequence to sequence problems and what it did was in the encoder it used to have uh, it used to create some hidden representations of the input sequence taking the input um piece like it could be a text or it could be a part of a speech um one by one so it was mostly one word at a time it would create these hidden representations which would then go to the decoder and it would try to decode to the output sequence one by one however when um mapping all of these input sequences to hidden representations we figured it was very diff- difficult 
to map it to a fixed length representation every time, which is where attention came into the place. So attention is a concept in which basically every input sequence is focused on or taken a weighted average of. So let's say, for example, in the sentence, a woman is throwing a frisbee in the park. We want to know in this picture which part of the picture is frisbee focusing on. So then the model will look at all of the components, all of the pixels, and um, as a good output, it will generate this huge um, brightness on the frisbee, which we see on the left top corner. So attention, it was this similar concept in which we look at the input sequence, but we don't look at it in a uniform way. We look at it in a weighted average sort of manner. So we know which parts of the input to focus on. And this was actually a very huge thing because now all of the models that have been coming up are using attention in some form of the other. Uh, one thing that I would also like to point out is that in encoder decoder models, we usually have these um, generalization. So encoder can be any neural network. What it was introduced as was an LSTM, but it could be a convolutional neural network. It could be an attention-based network. And this is where we see the newer class of models coming up. So transformer. Now, the way the transformer has become popular is because of two main things. One is that it introduced the concept of self-attention. And self-attention was that not only does the output need to look at um, some sort of a weighted uh, average of the input hidden representations, but that input itself could focus on certain other parts of the input. And that is why it looks at the self. And when the transformer introduced that in a multi-head manner, they figured that they beat a lot of the existing benchmarks in the NLP um, research. The other thing was that it was parallelized. So they introduced the concept of positional embeddings in which you didn't have to pass the input one by one. You could pass it parallelly through the network, which meant you could fasten a lot of the training and inference. And the newer class of models, which is um, the pre-trained models we're seeing right now, like BERT, GPT, T5, they're all getting very popular because they're trained on huge amounts of data and they're really big. Now, the huge amounts of data we get are from the internet, like common crawl or um, the huge Wikipedia base. And BERT is really, really popular because BERT could revolutionize that by pre-training very good tasks such that it became a very efficient language model. For example, one of the tasks of BERT was to look at a piece of text, mask some of the words in between them, and then try, the, uh, try to get the model to predict them. There was also this task of sentence prediction in which you're given one sentence and you're asked the model to predict the next one. So all of these kind of tasks, they're trying to involve the model such that it gets information about um, different languages, different ways the grammar is uh, parsed and everything. And a lot of the pre-trained models now, like GPT, um, the different flavors of BERT, T5, they're also available in multilingual form. All right. So the way this talk is sectioned is that we're going to be talking about um, two major things. One is what we already know from the industry. So oftentimes, whenever we start with any NLP or any machine learning model, we know that there are experiments that have already been done in the past. And so what we're going to be doing now is cover some of them. So I just want to point out it's not complete. It's not exhaustive. There is a lot of research in the community, and it's not possible to cover that in just one talk. However, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the class of research that exists. We're going to look at some common results. And then in the next section, we'll proceed to some of, well, my mistakes that I've done in the past. All right, so now let's talk about um, something that we know from research, which is experiments with vocabulary size. So as it's very intuitive, if we use a very big training data, we need a bigger vocabulary to encapture all of the corpus that we have. Let's look at some of the research experiments that have been done and the usual um, vocabulary size that has been used. So as we see here, 30 to 40,000 is pretty popular. 
and also 90 and 100,000. And the reason is because when this new pre-processing technique, which is BPE, byte pair encoding, and we'll talk about that in a later slide. When this came about, the authors introduced a 90,000 size, which won the competition. So these are the results on uh, the workshop on machine translation, which is a very popular workshop, which is where we get a lot of research and experiments from. And um, so as can be seen, a lot of um, experiments were done on the 30 to 40,000 as well. Now, it's not just the training data that um, vocabulary can depend on. There can be other dependencies like the architecture. So let's say you're working with an LSTM-based architecture. There are certain, again, research papers that show you that, okay, BP is more popular than just the regular word segmentation. So in one of the researches, they showed that having a BPE, which is synonymous uh, with vocabulary size nowadays, um, having a vocabulary size of about 32,000 is a good start, unless you have something lesser than a million parallel corpus. So parallel corpus is usually used in the context of machine translation, but it basically means that you have um, a million examples, which are mapping one sequence to the output sequence. So the authors show that if you have less than 1 million parallel corpus, BP of 16,000 is better. And whenever we compare the results on translation, a lot of them are going to be on the blue score. And the blue score is the primary metric. And the higher it is, the better is the performance. All right. Then a contradictory research also shows that, in fact, BPE could be um, better to some extent. But when you use a slightly larger LSTM, a character-based model is the way to go. And the authors, Cherry and others, in 2018, they showed this on multiple data sets, wherein the character-based models, they outperform the ones with BPE. The purpose of this is just to show you the class of research that exists. Now, there are 100 papers that have been published. But we know about certain trends that exist with vocabulary size and certain dependencies that exist with architecture. Um, another study that was published for transformer-based architectures was that we did not need a very high vocabulary size to get started with. So the authors here in 2019, they showed that having a vocabulary size of even 500 or 1,000 is beneficial for transformer-based architectures. One thing to note over here in all of these papers is that it's very important to look at the data sets they're working with. So like here, um, the authors showed this for low resource languages, which means for something uh, they don't have a lot of parallel corpus for. And they showed that for re languages which are low resources, um, you can actually use a small vocabulary size when using transformers. And this is how we know that if we have transformers versus um, LSTMs, we need to use different vocabulary sizes. Now let's go on to something about training data. One of the things that is more commonly known is that more the data, better is the performance of your model. And to look at that, um, let's look at some quantitative results we have. So, the authors, um, Gu and others, in 2018, they showed that if you have a higher corpus size, for example, 60K, 600K, the blue scores increase monotonically. And they showed that for multiple neural machine translation models. In another study, we see that if we have a base data set, Augmenting or supplementing it with something that is found probably on the internet is also beneficial. So the authors here with a specific focus on African languages, they found out that adding more data set to both, even the statistical machine translation or the neural machine translation, it improves performance. And this was replicated on two of their um, data sources that they checked. Then another thing that is also seen is that um, sometimes when we have a huge corpus already, your performance might saturate. 
and that is here. So for English to French translation, the authors, Cherry and others, in 2018, they found out that the uh, performance basically saturates between 15 and 40 million. So sometimes when we're working with uh, training data and we know the size of the data we have, it's useful to look at these commonly used um, data sizes, commonly used models, commonly used vocabulary sizes, because they serve as a good starting point. All right. So now let's look at um, the whole data machine learning pipeline one by one. The first step, as we always have, is the data. And more often than not, it will be the case that we won't have enough data for the problem. However, with the recent um, advances in neural machine translation, um, it's important to note when should we actually opt for neural networks versus when we should opt for statistical networks. So by, this is the, like a very common graph. So basically, if you have a statistical machine translation, the power of neural networks only shows if you have a huge amount of data. To quantify this graph on the left, the authors show that basically, if you have a larger corpus, your statistical machine translation again performs well as the corpus size increases. However, the power of neural networks comes into place as more and more data is introduced. So as can be seen, this 10 to the 8 power of corpus size is when the neural machine translation starts to work better. However, it will often be the case that no matter um, what we have, we don't really have an enough um, data size. So what can we do with small data set? Well, we can look at it from two ways. One is that we add more data. So we augment the original data with something that exists, and that could be artificially generated data. So for example, let's say we have a very reliable system that can translate English to Swahili. And we don't have um, very good, or, or like we don't have a very huge data set for Swahili at all. So we can use that reliable system to generate artificially generated data. However, one thing to note over here is that there will be noise because it's not completely 100% human annotated. However, this is a trade-off that I think we often need to work with, that adding noise versus adding more data and which is more beneficial. Another thing that you could look at is the open source data sets that are available. So for example, there are a lot of good resources on Google data set, um, Kaggle, and especially from industry and academia. For example, the most research, uh, so, sorry, the most recent one published was No Language Left Behind by Meta. And they published the exact procedure to create the data set and the language model is huge over here, which they built with this data set. So using all of these um, open source data sets can also be the way to go. However, the other way to look at that is that if we don't have enough data in any manner, we can change the black box or change the model we're working with. It's not necessary to work with neural models all the time. As was seen earlier, statistical machine models, they actually perform better with smaller data sets. On the other end of the spectrum, another way to look at this is to use these huge pre-trained models that already have a lot of inco information incorporated in them and use transfer learning to get the final juice out of it. So this is often useful for low resource languages. And you can also look at some of the existing research on transfer learning. So for example, again, Agu and others in 2018, they showed that having one universal representation for all words in different languages, it helped in zero or few short learning, which is good for languages which you have zero training data or very small training data for. So basically, they had universal representations for every word in multiple languages, which meant you could map each word to one point in the sum n-dimensional space. And if you're looking at pre-trained models, there are a lot of them available open source. There's a universal sentence encoder, BART, T5, BERT, and there are multilingual flavors available for them. Now, Let's talk a little bit about data quality. When we have enough data, the question is, does quality matter? 
and here i don't mean the quality that you already know you can improve upon it's not something like pre processing or cleaning is that we have enough data set and we have this data set in which all of them all of the examples at least have some sort of a quality metric it could be that some examples are high quality or high reliable than others which are low quality or less reliable so then the question is okay if we have all of this data and some of it we know is not very high quality should we remove that data so essentially the question that um, you're probably asking is in this matrix of quantity and quality where do you want your data set to lie now one um, trade off is that if you're removing data you're removing some sort of information that exists in the model and if you don't want to do that you can think about going for a bigger model if it's affordable then that leads to the questions of well there are trade offs of computational resources inference time and maintainability and if your model size um is enough that you can afford um higher computational resources for example higher training time higher inference time um is it going to be maintainable in the future is it sustainable if you can do that then that is the way you can also experiment another question that comes over is that is the majority data domain specific now often we always work with data that is very very specific very local to us that data is not usually available um anywhere in any research problems and the question is that we have all of these research data but if we don't have enough domain specific data what is the way to go well if you can get to as much domain specific data as possible but if you don't then using pre trained models can be a good way to go because these pre trained models already have at least some sort of a language model information already in them all right so now that we've talked about all the research that already exists um and what we've learned from the black boxes um let's look at how real world data science in action works right so majority of my time i am not researching or de or building i'm mostly debugging and the reason is because while researching and cleaning data sets and modeling takes up time what happens is once you deploy a model to production or to experiment you you realize that there are certain bugs that you only see at the end and not in the middle of the pipeline and i've spent countless hours debugging um trying to solve where i've gone wrong and it hasn't been fun so hopefully the next few slides will um give you an idea of what can go wrong while um working with your whole machine learning pipeline for sequence sequence models all right now one of the errors that i've made is not taking care of distributions so the problem is arises when you merge different data sources together now it could be that you're merging all of them at the same time or it could be that let's say source 2 and source 3 are something that were already there in your model and now you're trying to add source 1 which is a newer source of data which means that basically this is as close to the real time as possible whereas this is a little older now when you merge those data sources together the distributions are going to be different and that in turn leads to very different distributions for training validation and test set so often um the mistake i've made is let's say if i had a huge number of languages in source 2 and source 3 whereas source 1 i had only a few languages then source 2 and source 3 are going to be representing um those older languages but not source 1 so we don't have enough data for some of the languages now um and andrew wang in his book machine learning yearning says that you have to choose test and dev data sets to reflect data that you expect to get in the future so your validation and test data sets they have to be very close to the problem you're trying to predict and in fact in that time that you're trying to predict so they have to be very close to the future because we always predict for the future but there are a few things that we can do to ensure that those um distributions are well settled so one of the things um that you can check for example if you're checking different languages is just plot a histogram 
And these are very obvious things, and they may seem very obvious right now. But what happens when we are merging different data sets together is that it just goes under the rug. So um, this is, for example, um, the graph of languages for data that is being used by uh, BERT, which is Wikipedia. So as can be seen now, there are a bunch of different languages here. And a very similar graph can be generated for your own data. If you have numerical features in your sequence to sequence um, kind of data, you can look at certain aggregate statistics as well. You can look at certain um, correlations between different um, sort of sequences that exist. All right, so now that we have our data part settled, let's talk a little bit about how things can go wrong in the pre-processing components. Now, a lot of these things, and I'll state this again, are very, very obvious because I've done these obvious mistakes over and over again. Now, in all of the machine learning books, in all of the machine learning talks, in courses, the one thing that we are taught is that you have to ensure that your pipeline components, for example, if you're using a scaling unit, if you're using a tokenizer, they have to be the same across training, testing, and inference. And the reason is that if they're not, then you're probably comparing different things and you won't be able to make a very unbiased decision. So, and a lot of these things are often discovered all the way at the end when we reach the inference or, we, or when we reach the testing stage. And then you have to go back to square one, which is not easy at all. So here are a few things to keep in mind, which is just do the most obvious things. Ensure that you have same cleaning or pre-processing modules all the time. Ensure if you're working with vocabulary files, they're correct and they're the same in training, testing, and validation. Ensure that you have one single source of truth for config files. What I mean by that is, let's say you have a lot of hyperparameters, or you have a lot of global variables like input language, output language, or you have different data files for vocabulary and PPE. Ensure that you have one place where you store all of those global variables and files and call all of those files or variables from that single place. Because any change, if you do in that single source of truth, is easier to be carried over by those different um, downstream dependencies. And you can use unit tests to test very obvious things. For example, are you using the correct data set? Now, if you're working with a lot of database experiments where you're creating different versions of the data, it can be very easy to get lost in S3 buckets, in Hadoop, um, in different files, and ensure that you always have one single data set that you know is the one that you're going to be using in production or deployment. Are your input and output being parsed correctly? If you're using character-based or PPE-based or word-based models, are your input and output correctly shown to the model? Are you generating a valid vocabulary file? Is the vocabulary file that you've generated using BPE or any other tool, is it a valid one? Does it have enough number of words or not? And finally, code reviews are amazing. I've had countless number of times where um, even though I was the only one writing the code, my teammates have been helping me to find um, some of the bugs that I've made. All right, and to give you an example of what certain unit tests could look like, let's look at this piece of code. So again, we have a single source of config from which we are importing a lot of um, global variables. Then we're loading a model. And then you can check whether um, that model is the correct one. So for example, if you're using a third party library, like in a lot of these um, code snippets, I've used Fairseek, which is, a sequence to sequence toolkit by Meta. So you can check if it's indeed a model, if your BPE is configured correctly, if you're using the correct BPE file, if you're using the correct BPE tool, if you're, cur if you're using the correct vocabulary file, if your tokenizer is correctly set or not. You can check your hyperparameters like um, is your encoder embedding dimension, number of attention heads, um, the source language, target language, beam size, are they all correctly set or not? And these are very obvious. However, the 
point is to do them while you're building your pipelines and not afterwards when you're done. All right. So now that we've talked about um, starting with pre-processing, we can't really cover pre-processing without vocabulary generation. So vocabulary generation, um, let's talk about BPE now. So BPE is this concept of byte pair encoding, which is the idea of subword units. And it was introduced in 2015 um, in order to make the problem of open vocabulary generation, uh, language generation, easier. Now, we know that when we are talking about translation or we're talking about language generation, the reason that it's open vocabulary is that there are a huge amount of words available in all the languages. And it can't be possible to encode every word that exists. So we need to figure out a way to limit them. So that is why earlier we used to have a fixed size vocabulary and then everything that did not fall under that vocabulary was encoded as unknown. However, in 2015, the authors came up with this technique in which you can create subwords, which are something in between characters and words, and encode unknown words as combination of those subwords. So let's look at a few examples. So the way it works is that let's take the solar system which is in English, and we need to translate it to German and Hungarian. Now, German and Hungarian don't have two words. They have a single word for solar system. However, it's a compound word. So it can be segmented into Sonian system and Napenrenzer here. And now when the vocabulary looks at this, it probably may be an unknown for a fixed size vocabulary. But when we look at subwords, we can create these two subwords and we can create a merge operation between them and say that, yeah, these two can be merged together and they are frequently merged together. So we don't really need to have another word in our vocabulary, but just a merging operation. And the reason it helps us is that it compresses our vocabulary. We don't need thousands and hundreds of thousands of words, but just merge a few merge operations for our vocabulary size. And there are tools um, that help us to do that are subword NMT, which is the basic tool, and it has a few Python-based files that you can use. And the steps are um, divided into two. The first is you give these tools a set of the training that you want to learn um, the BPE from. And the second step is that you actually just give them the files that you want to apply that vocabulary or that merge operation to. Um, fast PPE is another tool that is a C++ API to subword NMT, and it's faster than the Python-based version. So while using these tools, often what is um, recommended is that if they share a common alphabet, then you basically just merge the input and output sequences together. And then you ask the tool to learn um, the merge operations from that concatenated data. However, if you're talking about two different languages, even if they share the same alphabet, it may be that the way we segment or the way we create subwords is only common to one language and not to the other. So to remove that bias, what we can do is we can supply this um, parameter vocabulary and a threshold. And we can easily say through the tool that if that segmentation or that symbol is not very um, frequently occurring in that language, then don't use it. And this is very important because you don't want to segment um, one language according to what is the segmentation in the other language. All right, some of the easier things that we can do is performing sanity checks. Now, BPE operations is the number of operations that you supply to the tool. And let's say you have this um, list of a thousand or a, a couple of hundred common words in your language that you do know are very useful and they need to be in your vocabulary. So what you can do is you can generate the vocabulary file from those tools, and then you can check that if all of the wo words in most common are in your vocabulary set or not. Now, this is a very obvious check. However, I've done this mistake before where 
when you keep something um, running, for example, your vocabulary generation tool stops midway, for example, because of a memory error, because of some computational errors, some technical error, and your whole um, process is cut in short, and then you don't realize it because the vocabulary is generated, however, it's just partial. So what you can do is just make sure that the size of the vocabulary um, is perfect. So you can check whether it follows the theoretical upper limit. So this is the upper limit for um, BPE size if you're given a set number of operations and the number of allowed characters that are in the alphabet. You can check if it's greater than something as well. And these are very simple checks to do and help um, before you actually proceed to the modeling part. So now that we've talked about what can go wrong while pre-processing, let's move on to modeling and think about how we can make certain practical choices. A lot of research right now is about these bigger models that are well um, trained on huge and massive um, corpus of data. But when we talk about deploying certain things or using certain things in applications, in web, in mobile, it's not really practical to use um, those models. So let's talk about what trade-offs we usually see. And before we do that, I'd like to point to this um, set of learning, which is in Andre Karpathy's um, blog, A Recipe for Training Neural Networks. I highly recommend it. It's really simple to read. And for anyone who's um, working with neural networks in any way, it's, it, it's, it's um, a set of those very common learnings that will be useful. So in the blog, he mentions that neural net is a leaky abstraction in that you will see um, it's not like a piece of software where you can, things can actually um, be predictable. So people can also be um, seen uh, writing neural networks in very few lines of code. And that is what these toolkits help us to do. However, knowing what is happening behind the scene is actually more important because whenever um, we're writing all of these pieces of code, they assume that your model will probably converge. However, that is not guaranteed. There are tons of things that can go wrong and it's easy to make assumptions on what is going wrong. However, it is much more dif difficult to actually debug using certain um, experiments or certain um, uh, mathematical approaches that we've seen in the research. The other thing is that neural net training fails silently. And now what we mean by that is, it's not something that will break your test. Even if you write hundreds of unit tests, sometimes your model may perform on good on validation set, however, not well on the testing set. Sometimes the model even performs well on the testing set. However, when you deploy it, it doesn't bring or it doesn't increase um, the respected key indicator. So then we have to debug as to what is happening. We need to go and look back at the data. We need to go and look back at the model again. So it fails silently. It won't, sometimes it won't break any tests, but you will still need to debug what is happening. Let's talk a little bit about how to get started with modeling. Now, Andre Karpathy, again, he recommends that you take the most common paper to your problem, copy paste the simplest architecture that receives good amount of performance, and then you go from there. And um, it's easy to get lost into these, again, these uh, billions of parameters as can be seen, like GPT-3 had 175 billion parameters, um, uh, BERT had 340 million uh, parameters, but they've been trained on hundreds of computational resources, um, training like on hundreds of hours. It's not really possible to train your own model from scratch. This is why it's easier to just get started with the simplest model that is possible. It's easier to debug. It's easier to see what is going into the model. You can check the gradients on your initial layer, the gradients on your last layer, you can visualize what things are happening if you have a simple model. And then he says, once you have a model large enough, just overfit it and then regularize. Um, a lot of the times while we want to use these uh, bigger models, another approach can be that you use the smaller versions like the Stillbird, the Stillbart, 
And these are all, again, open source and available. And they're much lightweight versions. And sometimes they give um, equal and better performances than their um, original bigger counterparts. All right. So now let's talk about iterating on the model architecture. Often when we are starting off with an architecture, we want to make certain changes on the model. However, it could also be that you're working on the data set side by side. It can be easy and even attractive to make multiple changes at the same time. However, in order to keep things simple, just make sure you add one feature at a time. If you're adding a data change, if you're using a different data version, don't mix data and model changes because you want to test your hypothesis one thing at a time. If you're adding more data set by um, adding a greater time frame, let's say you're adding five years worth of data, try doing that in multiples of one year or even quarters if you can. The reason is that all of these learnings, and often when we work in the industry, we don't really work on just one problem, we work on multiple problems. And these are learnings that are easily transferable to other problems. So if you have your hypothesis, you can easily apply the learnings from that to other problems. And then Andrew Ng, again, in his book, Machine Learning Yearning, he defines certain um, optimizing and satisfying metrics. What he means by that is uh, when you're working with a machine learning problem, you can have different metrics. And like in friends runtime, you can have an optimizing metric that you want to um, outperform things on, which could be something like a blue score or even your validation loss. What he says is first choose a satisfying metric like runtime. You say that you cannot um, have a model that is running beyond 100 millisecond or 150 millisecond. It can be anything. But that is something you have to abide by. And then you look at all of the models that are performing well under 150 millisecond. And then you optimize for the other metric, which could be your blue score. And this is um, preferable because you don't then need to look at multiple combinations of um, metrics that solve your problems. You satisfy one metric, and then you optimize the other metric. Um, and in order to find out what um, inference times you can actually expect, there are a lot of um, published researches, published articles from third party libraries like Hugging Face. There are hardware benchmarks like how the model performs on the GPU versus CPU by NVIDIA, Google Cloud, AWS. And they especially give you um, how they uh, created those benchmark results and what models they tested. So this can be very, very helpful. All right, so now let's talk a little bit about um, training and validation loss. So the first time I was actually working um, with sequence to sequence models, I was expecting that my validation loss will be always um, greater than the training loss because that is what is taught to us in all of these books. Um, and the reason behind that is because um, the training data is already being seen by the model. However, the validation data set is unseen. So in general, it's easier for the model to predict on the training data set than validation data set. And that is why the validation loss is usually higher. However, when I saw the opposite, I kind of freaked out because I didn't know what was happening. And then I turned to a couple of different research papers. Um, however, what came to my help was a couple of Twitter threads. Now, a lot of it is mentioned in the Twitter thread. However, if you, um, it, just to summarize uh, some of the learnings from them. So basically it could be that the data is leaking from the validation data set to the training data set. And what that means is if there is a leakage, then the model has already learned to predict on the validation set. And if that is so, the validation set being smaller, it's easier to predict on than the training set and the validation loss is lower. Another thing could be that the validation distribution um, is different than training distribution. It may be that all of the easier samples to predict on are in your validation set. In sequence to sequence model, it can mean that all of the easier generations, all of the easier translations can be in your validation data set. It may be easier to predict on, which is why it's now lower, the loss. Another thing is that regularization only occurs while training and not while testing or validation, which means that training is actually a harder task for the model because there is regularization, there are neurons being dropped. 
um, than what is during validation and testing. And that is actually okay. That is not an issue because regularization is a good thing. So in order to fix the first two, there are a few things we can do. We can build a strong validation set. We can add more data to it, make it harder for the model to predict on validation set. And then we can check sampling distribution. Like I mentioned before, checking sampling distribution is extremely important anytime you're merging or distributing or segmenting data sets. We can make sure that the training and the validation come from the same set, and especially validation and testing come from the same set again. All right, so these were a couple of my learnings and a few of the results that I've seen in the data set that hopefully were interesting. And we've talked about um, how to go about building models, how to go about researching, how to go about um, starting with something as an initial point and then iterating on them. I've also shared some of my ways that I fell um, into the holes with building these models. So hopefully you don't make the same mistakes as I did. And I also mentioned some of the ways that I now practice in order to avoid them in the future. A special thank you to um, my team at GoDaddy, who have been really, really helpful in um, helping me learn. And the team at PyCon APAC, who's been really organizing this very nicely. So thank you, and bye.